In the world of electrified powertrains, there are basically five options that you can go for. There is a 48 volt mild hybrid, which we don't really consider to be a hybrid. There is the traditional hybrid, which has been around since the Prius. There is the full battery electric vehicle, which we primarily feature on this channel. There's the hydrogen powered vehicle, which is interesting if there was infrastructure. And then there is the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle like this Lexus RX here. Now on paper, the plug-in hybrid seems like this perfect transitionary tool from going from a traditional hybrid or a gas powered vehicle to the full electric life. But is that actually the case? Is a plug-in hybrid really a transitionary product or is it all just marketing? Let's take a look at a few reasons why it is and it isn't the gateway drug to full electrification. If you believe everything you see on the internet, you would think that the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle is this ultimate device. It is this perfect transitionary thing to get you from gas to all electric because, hey, you can drive in all electric mode, but then you have gas to get you all the rest of the way. But there's one key thing you have to remember about a plug-in hybrid that I think a lot of people miss. You have to plug the thing in. Let's take a look at the most popular plug-in hybrid on sale in the United States. That's the Jeep Wrangler. Now, a Jeep Wrangler 4xe gets roughly 20, 21 miles of all electric range. Not super great, but like it'll get the job done if it needs to. The thing is though, when you're only driving on hybrid mode, so you've run out of electricity, that car combined EPA is 20 miles to the gallon um, per the window sticker. The base Jeep Wrangler will do 21 miles to the gallon just in a normal gas mode. So the plug-in hybrid, when it hasn't been plugged in, is less efficient than the less expensive gas-only model. Now sure, you're gonna say, well, there's still more power with the plug-in hybrid, but I don't see many people buying Jeeps outside of the 392 for the horsepower. They're buying it for the capability and sort of the, the posturing that comes with owning a Jeep. So then why is that plug-in hybrid so popular then if the least expensive vehicle is also more efficient if you're not plugging it in? Well, you see, some people do buy new cars. They go get a loan, you know, pay for 72 months at 9% now, whatever the, the interest rates are, because it's ridiculous, or, you know, they'll pay cash. And the thing is, yes, in that case, a plug-in hybrid vehicle is typically more expensive than the traditional hybrid variant. Take a look at the Prius, for example. The thing is, is a lot of people don't buy that way. They buy based on leasing. And when you lease, you can take advantage of the $7,500 tax credit, plus other local and state incentives that might exist. So when I looked up a Jeep Wrangler a couple of months ago, to get a Rubicon, you know, to a high-end Rubicon, it was like $650 a month to lease it, if you just went with the regular gas version but it was only like $450 a month to lease it if you had to plug in hybrid. So even if you never plugged it in and got the less fuel economy, you're still paying less per month on your lease. Now, yes, not every leasing is for everybody, but the point is a lot of people, when cars are becoming more expensive, a lot of people are resorting to leasing and a lot of people, believe it or not, do buy cars based on the monthly sales price. Recently, I had somebody at Toyota suggest to me that Chad, people aren't going to pay more for a car and then not plug it in. Which again, I'll counter, look at leasing. The, the leasing price is less money. I'll use Toyota's own payment estimator and I'll show you what a base Prius front wheel drive is and what a base Prius Prime front wheel drive is, which Prime only comes with front wheel drive, and show you the, the standard sort of lease offerings on both. As you'll see, the Prime is less money. So are people not plugging in plug-in hybrids? Is that what you're saying, Chad? Yeah, actually I am. When plug-in hybrids first sort of came out, um, automakers were very quick to say, oh look, this is our utilization rates on this and that. And a lot of those early adopters were plugging in their vehicles. But these modern plug-in hybrids, again, like this Lexus that I'm in now, Toyota isn't providing utilization rates. GM's not providing util utilization rates. HMD isn't. All of these automakers have the ability, because these cars are insanely connected, 
to be able to tell us, well, how often is somebody plugging in a plug-in hybrid? Nobody talks about it. And you might be saying, oh, well, just nobody's asked the question. Believe me, we have asked the question. And it's not our responsibility to prove that people aren't plugging it in. It's the automaker's responsibility to prove that people are plugging it in. And they're a mom about it, which means, which tells me, leads me to believe that people aren't actually plugging them in. When you go into a dealership to buy a plug-in hybrid, you should be qualified the same way that you would if you were to buy a full battery electric vehicle, which is, do you have the ability to charge at home? Do you have the ability to charge at work? If you don't, odds are a more traditional hybrid is probably the right vehicle for you. And the thing is, with most plug-in hybrids outside of the Outlander, PHEV, and the new Land Rover, is you have to use level 2 charging or level 1 charging to charge. You can't plug into a DC fast charger and replenish that 30 miles of range or whatever in 10 minutes. It's, it doesn't work that way. So you don't need to have a level 2 charger at home. These batteries are small enough that you can, on a level 1, get, get your charge overnight that you need, but you need to be plugging these in to take full advantage of what a plug-in hybrid has to offer. If you don't plug it in, odds are you're getting a little bit less fuel economy than you would with a traditional hybrid, and you just have a more complicated system. A plug-in hybrid, its electronics and its computers and its battery is all just, it's more complicated than a traditional hybrid. Not significantly, but some. And you're carrying around the extra weight of a 14, 15, 16, 20 kilowatt hour battery pack when you're not using it. So it's a waste of resources. It's a waste of everything. But because the way the incentive program is written and the way that it works is people are being able to lease these for cheaper than their gas equivalents. So is it a bunch of performative whatever? No, it isn't if you are somebody who actually plugs these cars in. And if you do, they're amazing. Like this Lexus RX here, the plug-in hybrid is definitely the best version of this trim. And it's not just a nicer RAV4. It's not a RAV4 Prime with a Lexus badge on it. Lexus invented this segment, this, this mid-size crossover luxury segment with the RX. And in its now gajillionth generation, it is good. Don't necessarily like the, the front hood thing, but this, this vehicle is excellent. The driver assist functions are excellent. The transmission, while CVT is smooth, it's quiet, the powertrain's quiet, the car's quiet, the technology is great. There's a lot of features. There's just, this is a very nice car. And actually I love the green that it comes into. This Lexus green is great. But like, it's a fantastic car and it's a fantastic version of this car. And with 37 miles on a good day of all electric range, that's enough to get you back and forth to work typically. And then you can still go to do the longer Costco run or whatever and have and run off gas for doing that. So like this car is fantastic if you're gonna plug it in. If not, save the extra money. Like don't, there's no need to do that when there are some perfectly great hybrids out there. Again, if you're looking at the Prius, the Prius Prime is excellent. It is the most powerful version of the Prius and we like it here a lot, but a lot of the driving that I do personally is a lot of highway stuff. I'd rather have the highway efficiency over the 30 or 40 miles of EV range. I'd probably be better off with just the hybrid. If you don't have access to home charging or at your workplace, the regular Prius is excellent. Like there's not a huge difference between the two other than you get a little bit more power and the optional solar roof. As regulations start to require 70 miles of range out of a plug-in hybrid, it might start making more sense to more people. But the thing is, at the end of the day, you still have to have the ability to charge it at home or at work, or you're not going to be able to take advantage of all of the benefits, all of the fun, all of the cost savings with fuel plus the environmental benefits by having a plug-in hybrid if you can't plug it in. You only need a level one. You don't need to do a level two, like I said before, but otherwise, that's not the reason to buy a plug-in hybrid. And maybe the government should close the loophole on plug-in hybrids. Maybe that's the answer to, to some of these problems. I don't know. I think that it's a good idea to incentivize vehicles like this, but please, for the love of all things holy, plug them in. Long story short, if you have the ability to charge at home or at work, then a plug-in hybrid vehicle makes a lot of sense. You can have one car in your garage, it'll drive back and forth to work each day on electric only, but if you need to go across the country or you have an emergency, you still have gas that will power the vehicle. If you don't have that ability to plug in, then you're just carrying around extra weight and complexity and cost in a lot of cases for no real reason, and you'd be better off with just a traditional hybrid in your garage. 
If you like the idea of this Lexus RX but want a full electric experience, check out our full review of the Lexus RZ450e by clicking on the link right over here.